Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Legend Iron Man walkthrough of XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. Now, last time we left off after making contact with the Templars, the third resistance faction, and we also completed an advent retaliation mission. As a result, we now have a new bond to take care of, as Specialist Van Dyke and Sharpshooter Ada Lynn have grown close, so let's confirm that bond and allow them to strengthen it in future missions. Of course, we will also take a photo and I think this one here works nicely. The fact that both of them seem to like their faces covered definitely plays into their chemistry. Now, moving on, we also need to choose our next covert action. And also thanks to your feedback in the comments of the last episode, I think the choice here is quite clear. We are going to reduce the progress on the Avatar project to buy ourselves a bit more time. For the sergeant rank soldier, we will then select Grenadier Twitchy. If I'm not mistaken, the next mission has a chance of the Chosen to show up and she still has the negative fear of the Chosen trait, so we won't take her on that mission anyway, which makes her a suitable candidate to do something else instead. Meanwhile, the recipient of the aim bonus will be our skirmisher Pratal Mox, as the skirmisher class actually benefits from aim bonuses quite a bit, since they are built around the ability to fire their weapons multiple times per turn. And since we have enough to spare, we will also allocate 25 supplies to negate the risk of anyone getting captured, especially with these two that would be very inconvenient. Covert is our specialty. Let's just hope your people can keep up. And there we go, 8 days it will now take, thanks to us having an engineer staffed in the resistance ring, plenty of time to continue scanning, and we are in the middle of making contact with Eastern Europe, so let us continue to do that. I have made a number of interesting discoveries, Commander. Alright, and there we are with a very important milestone in this series, we have finally unlocked magnetic weapons. As a result, our damage output over the next few episodes will now increase dramatically, and we can also enjoy a short demonstration. These magnetic-based weapons are a lot like the early railgun prototypes. They fire projectiles at extremely high velocity. Commander, with the Advent Officer currently in cold storage, we should perform the autopsy as soon as possible. Okay, so with Tygen reminding us of the project that would further the game's main storyline, let's quickly take a look at what we have unlocked here, because as you can see on the left, quite a few new items have just become available for purchase. Now, just like in the first game, not every weapon is immediately upgraded to its magnetic counterpart. For some, we still have to complete additional research projects, but right away we immediately have the Templar's auto pistol as well as the skirmisher bullpup, and also magnetic counterpart parts to the pistol, the shotgun and the assault rifle. We also have a technology breakthrough to report that I don't think we will pursue. Spending 10 days of research to cut 12 days off of the training center's construction time does not really seem worth it to me. And so instead, we will now in fact make some plotline progress by selecting the Advent Officer Autopsy. As you can see, this only takes 5 days, even with only one scientist, and we definitely want to complete it sooner rather than later, just because of the stuff that is unlocked afterwards. The Advent Officers appear to be similar, if not physically the same as the common Advent Trooper, in terms of power and agility. However, field reports indicate a more developed mental acuity, as the officers do provide tactical directives to the subordinate Advent forces. Alright, so at this point you can also see that constructing the power relay will actually be finished two days after we have cleared new building space, which is not ideal, so let's make a small change. Commander, I'm going to need more help on the engineering team before I can start clearing out some of these other rooms. We should recruit an engineer. By reassigning our engineer Dr. Isaac Schmidt, we will now actually start digging downwards towards the first exposed power coil. As you can see, it will take us quite a while to get there though. And so, let us now keep scanning. After all, contact with our next resistance region is more or less imminent. Hunter is after something in this area. And of course they are, but we'll deal with that when it's time. For now, our monthly income has increased by 60 supplies, and we have also established links to a few critical territories. 
New regional contacts located. And yes, indeed, we can now make contact with East Africa, where, as you can see, an advent facility is located. The same is true for West Asia, the region that we actually need to contact as part of the game's main plotline. And we could also make contact with New India now, although at the moment that does not seem too pressing. Before we do anything else, though, we are reminded that our monthly supply drop is still outstanding. Avenger plotting new course. So let's go ahead and grab that. We do have to make a few purchases soon, so we could definitely need it. Commander, the aliens continue to make progress on the Avatar project. If we're going to slow them down, we'll need to move fast. All right, and as the Avatar Project progress bar continues to tick up, we are also informed that Van Dyke's negative Fear of the Chosen trait has successfully been removed. So let us immediately plug the next candidate into the infirmary. Grenadier Twitchy is still out on the covert action, but unfortunately we do have two more soldiers affected. And let's go by rank here, continuing with Bartosz Smoo B. Afterwards, we can then continue scanning with the supply drop and a few construction projects about to be finished very soon. Alright, the alien machinery has been cleared, we have a new building space and we have gained some supplies and alloys. Maximum power consumption reached. However, at the moment we can't actually do much with the new room as we are lacking power. Luckily though, it will take us only one more day until that's solved too. In the meantime, we can put our now free engineer Baron von H on excavation duty as well, and then continue to scan to finally complete that supply drop. Commander, we've got local resistance forces waiting to make contact, but we'll have to make the first move. And there we are, supply drop collected, and no, we can't actually acquire any more resistance contacts at this point. And because I also think that we have enough supplies at least for the moment, let's fly back to the skirmisher HQ, just to get all that building and excavating done a bit faster. Avenger plotting new course. Power relay now operational. And immediately after arriving, the power relay is finished, and that means we are now ready to build our next facility. Now, the relay increases our total power capacity by plus three, but we can increase that even further by staffing an engineer in here. Additionally, we can also get plus two power by upgrading the power conduits, which costs just 80 supplies and a monthly upkeep of 10. At the moment though, we have no need for either one of them, and we'll actually also not build anything here just yet, as the Advent Officer Autopsy is about to be finished in just one day, and without spoiling anything, the results of that might change what we want to do here. Okay, so it looks like before we do some building, it's time for the next mission, as we receive this month's selection of Guerrilla Ops. All three take place in regions controlled by the Hunter, and if I'm not mistaken, an appearance is guaranteed on this one. Meanwhile, making the choice which mission to take is a bit difficult, because even though we don't desperately need another engineer at this point, countering the unknown dark event might prevent something bad from happening. Similar deal in Western Europe then, the supplies are not really needed right now, but it sure would be nice if priests and officers do not get free reaction shots. West Africa, meanwhile, allows us to counter the dark event that I'm actually least worried about. However, it also gives us the reward that I think we need the most. So let's think about this for a second as we take a quick visit over to engineering. Just give the word and I'll get started, Commander. Now, with a mission coming up, it's time to finally upgrade to those magnetic weapons. And unlike in the first game, this process is actually a lot more straightforward. For example, if we wanted to upgrade the ranger's shotgun, then all we need to do is to purchase the shotgun here once, and that immediately makes the weapon available to use for every ranger we have. So we no longer need to purchase individual weapons for everyone, and because of that we usually want to grab all of these as soon as they become available. For now though, we'll play it safe and only grab those weapons that we actually need on this mission, and that excludes the bullpup and the magnetic rifle, saving some supplies and alloys. That also means that we are in fact leaving the two most expensive upgrades for later. Not that we are really hurting for supplies at the moment, but alien alloys are a valuable resource and we don't want to spend them recklessly. And with all of those purchases made, let us now head back and make that decision. And I think we will in fact go with the Intel reward. Yes, that might make things a little bit harder in terms of dark events, but we really need more Intel if we want to keep that Avatar project progress bar low. Setting course for West Africa.
Our squad for this one is then actually the same as last time, only with Dragonova replaced by our new Templar, a class that does have some melee capabilities, and that should come in handy against the Hunter and their brittle weakness. Loadout-wise, Starfall Antec and Templar Logan already have magnetic weapons. Grabbing the shotgun did actually also automatically apply the upgrade that Starfall had on his previous weapon. The rest is still using conventional stuff or some of the weapons of the hunt. And that actually also goes for Zunami's pistol. Despite having purchased the mag pistol upgrade, she still has the Shadowkeeper equipped, because against the Hunter there might come a time where we need that 100% guaranteed hit, even though the damage output is one point lower. Ranger deployed. We're in the pipe. Five by five. We've picked up a weak signal coming from a group of resistance operatives. Apparently they've stumbled on the location of an advent data vault storing files critical to the alien's latest project. As far as we can tell, hostile forces also picked up on the signal and they weren't about to leave anyone from the resistance alive. We're going in to sweep the site, eliminate all hostile forces and find the assets. Menace 1 5. We've got a bead on the Advent Data Vault near your position. Be advised. Self detonating charges are in place at the target. Move to disarm and extract the package before events are destroyed. Alright, so here we are once again on a timer, although we're not too far away from our target. With a specialist in the squad, we actually also don't need to get all the way there, and our five person squad also has concealment. Before we get going, though, let's learn a bit more about our latest recruit, Templar Logan. As Templar warriors, my followers specialize in wielding psionic energy, mastering the power that belongs to all who are truly of this earth. Through intense focus, we can twist the very fabric of the world around us to suit our needs. Right, so we're introduced to Focus, the Templar's special mana bar, if you will, and we fill up this bar by killing enemies with our Templar, specifically by using his Rend ability. Rend is the Templar's special melee attack, which is always guaranteed to hit. If it doesn't kill, it can also stun or disorient a target, but to obtain Focus, it has to be used to land the killing blow. At this point, it is not quite as powerful as our ranger's melee attack, but the damage output of Rend actually rises dynamically as the focus bar fills up. As that happens, we will also unlock access to vaults, basically chain lightning, which costs one point of focus, so if we want to use it, we have to do some prep work. For the moment though, Logan can start by scouting ahead. Alright, and that immediately reveals our first group of enemies, a stun lancer, a viper, and some sort of mechanoid. This is a new type of enemy that we have not yet encountered. As you can see, heavily armored, but its health pool is actually quite manageable. Offensively then, their gun is actually able of shredding armor itself, while they can also launch a cluster of small missiles as an area of effect attack. In total, we are definitely looking at way too many hit points to deal with all of this in one go, so let's move up our squad here and stay out of sight for now. Okay, so our enemies have remained where they are, and at this point we also want to take note of the Advent Watchtower right next to them. This is what's actually causing the fairly large detection radius, and using our specialist Van Dyke, we can actually attempt to hack it. However, a 63% chance to gain squad sight with him is not really worth it in my opinion, especially considering that on the not entirely unlikely chance that the hack fails, all enemies will be alerted to our presence. And because Van Dyke's hacking skill is also still too low to give us a reliable chance to take control of the mech with Haywire protocol, let us instead make a few minor moves to increase our hit chances by a few percent, and then we kick things off with the ever-popular Overwatch ambush. I'm on it. I'm on it. This time, however, by using Van Dyke's Frost Bomb early to immobilize the mech and the Stun Lancer for one turn. This is an extremely well equipped mechanized combat unit. We'll need to look around to avoid taking that thing out. It's dead. It has to be dead. And there we are successful ambush, but we're only getting started. Thank you. 
so many choices. All right, and as expected, the hunter is here as well. I had planned for that, but that certainly doesn't make things any easier. So little time. We just picked up a unique signature. One of the Chosen is here. That thing is only going to make trouble for us until we deal with it. Okay, so for now the Hunter is still roaming around in the shadows and our two enemies over here are still frozen. And if we play things smart here and have a bit of luck, then we should hopefully be able to obtain two valuable bonuses. First of all though, Van Dyke's combat protocol can shine, usually only dealing two points of damage against organic enemies, but more than doubling that against mechs while also bypassing their armor. Alright, that's five points of damage. Up next is Grenadier Nicholas, who, despite being able of shredding armor, will now actually take aim at the Stun Lancer. And with the Stun Lancer down to only two hit points, we can now grab the first and arguably more important of those aforementioned two bonuses. No problem, boss. As Sharpshooter Zanami can now regain concealment thanks to the Shadow Keeper. Impressed yet? Now that leaves the mech and, crucially, also the Watchtower. I'm trusting you here. However, a grenade from our ranger swiftly deals with one, while leaving the other vulnerable for the killing blow. Fire and all! And that killing blow now comes at the hands of Templar Logan and is guaranteed despite one last point of armor. Terminated. The strength of the Templars ebbs and flows with the tide of combat. As we focus our energy, our power increases and can be unleashed upon our enemies. Alright, so we have gained our very first point of focus and we're now also introduced to momentum, because anytime Logan uses rent, he actually gains a free movement action afterwards. As you can imagine, that is very useful to get us out of those compromising positions that melee attacks often put us in. For now, though, he can simply move into full cover. Moving to position. You Templars sure do like making a big show out of parlor tricks. Alright, so the Hunter is on the move, although for the moment it does look like we won't make contact just yet. running out, Commander. Okay, so with four turns left, we are almost already in dashing range of the container, and we also have a cloaked tsunami to help us scout out its vicinity. Unfortunately though, it also looks like we have run into a bug that I forgot about, because for some reason destroying these watchtowers does not actually remove their sight radius. Simply hacking them, meanwhile, does achieve that, so this is clearly an oversight, so let me see if I can quickly find a mod to fix this. Alright, so I've quickly installed to the Advent Security Tower fix, link in the description down below, and Tsunami can now move a lot more freely. Solid copy. And since the clock is ticking, we should also do that. Conveniently enough, there is some high ground available. Okay, so for some reason she has just inofficially spotted another group of enemies, similar to the one we faced earlier, only with a Sectoid instead of a Viper. Again, these do not officially count as detected yet, but we sure don't want to risk anything. So this here is about as far as I dare moving up with anyone else, onto the stairs, but technically still remaining on the level below. Come on in, our enemies then move a bit closer towards the container. We've got a hostile squad here. And that is also enough for Ada Lynn to officially spot them. The hunter then appears in sight range as well, but our sharpshooter is cloaked, so they immediately go back to where they came from. Menace 1 5, the clock is ticking. That detonator isn't going to wait. Get to the vault and disarm it before we run out of time. 
And yes, indeed, time is of the essence here, but in order to be able to calculate where we can safely move with everyone, it would certainly help to have line of sight to that next group of enemies. So let's see if our sharpshooter can spot them from down here. And indeed she can, at least the stun lancer, which means the rest of our party should be safe to move up at least a little bit. Keep in mind that Van Dyke can actually hack the contents of the container from pretty far away, so we don't need to press too far onwards here. Legen wir endlich los. Alright, very nice. The sectoid's movement triggers some reaction fire here. And because it's the enemy's turn, we will not get anything in return. Enemy is still up! Unfortunately though, most of the overwatch shots actually missed their targets, and I think the hunter will now also become a bit more active. You can't run, and you can't hide. You really think you can hide from me? Okay, so from the enemy group we only have the sectoid injured so far, albeit pretty heavily. The hunter meanwhile has put the comparatively harmless tracking shot mark on our Templar Logan, and he is not going to stay put anyway, instead using rent to kill the sectoid and grab his second point of focus. Hostile target the down. On the objective. If Advent were any good, they wouldn't need me. I can't have you making me look bad out here, Commander. That last fight, just a fluke. Menace 1-5, this is Avenger. We have positive confirmation of the target package. Move to acquire. It's one of the Elders chosen! Now, this unfortunately detects the Hunter for good. Interestingly enough, however, that also results in the container detonation timer being paused, which is indicated by the fact that the circles around the timer are now greyed out. So, until the Chosen is defeated, the timer will remain at 2, which gives us a bit more breathing room. A slash attack from our Ranger then takes care of the Stun Lancer, while Sniper Zunami can now reveal herself and go after the mech. It hit the plate! we got eyes on you. And 4 points of damage, that's perfect, as it potentially saves us from having to use a grenade here, depending on whether or not Van Dyke can once again do 5 points of damage with combat protocol. And he can, the mech also drops some loot in the process, and so Grenadier Nicholas is now free to move into full cover. And because the Hunter is not in grenade range, we will simply go on overwatch with him. While our Templar takes full cover as well to end our turn. The Hunter then summons an Advent Trooper, which actually can't act on this turn. Although, unfortunately, that is followed up by a rifle shot shortly after. Luckily though, the full cover works in our favor this time, and I think Hunter and Trooper are actually also the last remaining enemies on this mission, so here's what we're going to do. First of all, with Van Dyke, we want to hack the container. Ich es. Using his drone, he can do that from over here, and even though that uses up one of his actions, it is important for what comes next. Now disarming the detonator is guaranteed and we will of course go for the satellite data reward here. Improved scanning times for 4 weeks, that could actually be huge, depending of course on which kind of rumors we run into on the world map. And we also managed to grab it, albeit just barely. Either way, we are now ready for things to go boom. Haben Zugriff. Wir haben die Ware. Menace 1-5, status confirmed. The charges are inactive and the package is secure. Eliminate any remaining hostiles near the AO. Now, up next we can launch a grenade with Nicholas, and yes, I know what you're thinking, we are hitting the loot here. 
And while loot would in fact get destroyed if the enemy holding it is killed with an explosive, that is not the case once the loot has already been dropped. So let's ignore the friendly fire warning here, that's for the container that we have already used, and remove the hunter's one point of armor. Alright, lovely. Hunter without armor, trooper without cover, I think that's as good as it gets. Time to now make use of the hunter's brittle weakness against melee attacks. As Ranger Starfall moves in, he can also quickly grab a scope and a conditioning PCS, before we then use his free axe throw, which actually benefits both from the flanking bonus to critical hit chance, as well as from the brittle damage bonus. Where did you dig that thing up? It's probably older than you are. And with a crit, Starfall deals a lovely 12 points of damage, ready to follow that up with a slash now. Okay, so the hunter remains standing with only one single hit point. Luckily though, we have another melee unit waiting just around the corner. Hostile terminate. And there we are, once again the hunter has been defeated, so I think that's the third time in this playthrough, and we will receive a big pile of ability points as a result. You surprised me once again, Commander. Maybe I need to reconsider my tactics. I'd say we owe our people a break after taking down that Chosen Commander. I doubt it'll be long before we see that thing again, though. So then, here we are, the container has been looted, the hunter has been defeated, and this guy right here is the last enemy standing between us and the completion of this mission. And from her vantage point, Sniper Zunami does have a guaranteed kill. Did you see that one? Status confirmed. All hostiles are down and the area is secure. Status confirmed. Mission accomplished. And there we are. This went about as well as it could have, and once again we come away with a flawless mission rating. As you have surely noticed though, the types of enemies we are facing are getting a bit more interesting, so it is definitely a good thing that magnetic weapons are now here to help us out. The mission photo then puts our Templar front and center, and with that I think it's time that we head back to the base. And despite the destruction left in their wake, XCOM refuses to let go of the ways of the old world. They will continue their wanton and reckless crimes until the entire world burns around them. We are grateful to the Elders for their support in ending this menace once and for all. At least we know these Chosen can be killed. Well, temporarily. So then, here we are, no injuries, but no promotions either. We did, however, obtain a lovely list of loot, since that last trooper also dropped something. And indeed, this looks pretty damn good. Six weapon attachments and a PCS, all of that from only two loot drops. That Vulture Resistance Order has definitely been worth it so far. We have also obtained a bunch of corpses, including our very first Mechorex, and let's also not forget the 87 units of intel that we obtain as a mission reward. Considering the limited resources available to you, Commander, you have still managed to exceed my expectations. Excellent work. So yes indeed, some much needed intel and we have also countered the Stiletto Rounds Dark Event, although again I did not consider that one to be that much of a threat. We are also informed here that we are low on scientists, with just one at the moment, and I have to agree, so hopefully another one can be recruited soon. Commander, combat against the aliens day in and day out is no easy task, and eventually the stress takes its toll in various ways. We'll need to keep an eye on each soldier to manage their traits. We are then also informed that Van Dyke has apparently acquired a negative trait. Once again, he is reported to have developed Fear of the Chosen. I am not entirely sure if that's actually the case though, especially considering that three others have apparently developed it as well. And coincidentally, this is the exact same list of people who also received this trait in the last Chosen Sabotage. 
Now, as you can see, we can't actually check that directly in the infirmary without cancelling the recovery process for Smoo B. If we quickly head over to our list of soldiers, though, then we can see Van Dyke is in fact unaffected. Otherwise, he would have that blue symbol next to his bondmate icon that Twitch and Smoo also have. So, no need to panic, this here just a little delay in the flow of information. Either way, we will actually continue scanning for just a little while longer, and with the next rumor here offering an intel reward, we will also go for that right away. Avenger plotting new course. Commander, the aliens have made significant progress toward their goals. New advent facilities are cropping up around the world. All right, it's yet another avatar facility, this time in the United States. Nothing we can really do about that at the moment, though, so let's keep scanning. And yes, indeed, that was our COVID action coming to an end. Our people seem to work well together, Commander. And as a result, progress on the Avatar project has now been reduced by two points. Twitchy and Mox also survived the mission without taking any injuries, and so it is now time to immediately launch the next one. This time, we will actually start hunting the Hunter, completing this before the next supply drop will unlock another resistance order slot from the skirmishers, and it would still allow us to start gathering intel before the list of actions here is reshuffled for the next month. For our squad, meanwhile, we will send out Van Dyke, so Specialist Trumenian will likely have to step in for the next mission. The mobility bonus will go to Ranger Warhog, who already has one, so this should make him even faster, and of course we will also assign a third soldier here to negate the soldier wounded risk, and once again this role will fall to one of our other rangers, Hussar Sobieski. We will work hand in hand with our new allies. If we take a closer look at the full event queue, then you can also see it. This covert action will wrap up just two days before the next supply drop, so for the next monthly report, we will be able to benefit from the faction relationship increase. For now, though, we will keep scanning, as we have a very important research project about to be completed. I take it this was easier than your last procedure, Doctor. Central, Commander. Yes, I find the process to be far less disconcerting when the subject has already expired. The results, however, it's best you see for yourself. My autopsy of the Advent Captain has confirmed the existence of an implant, similar in design to the unit I extracted from the Commander. But there are differences. What kind of differences? The data you see is being pulled directly from this Advent Captain's implant. The sequence here is essentially you, Commander. Or at least the tactical information they were processing through your mind. As you can see, the data is nearly identical. They were using you against us. Yes, however, the Advent data shows signs of decay. Removing the Commander from their network has likely caused significant damage. Network? Yes. What we're seeing here is a psionic network. These implants are capable of receiving and transmitting information, a great deal of information, somehow encoded in a stream of psionic energy. My working theory? Advent uses this network to augment the tactical readiness of its troops, as well as disseminate orders from its central command. Observe. subject's diminished condition, the implant continues to have an effect. A truly astonishing achievement. Or a weakness. Potentially. But I need direct access to their network to know for sure. I'm guessing that won't be easy. We'd need an active link. And that would mean hacking a live Advent officer. Like I said, not easy. Still, it's the best lead we've got. Your call, Commander. New objective added. And yes, this is why I wanted to keep scanning for just a little while longer, since completing the Advent Officer autopsy does not only give us a lovely little cutscene, much more importantly, it also unlocks the Proving Ground facility, a strong candidate for that building spot that we have recently opened up. 
As you can see here, this proving ground is needed to construct the Skulljack, which we will then have to use on a live Advent Officer to further the game's main storyline. I've updated our latest operational objectives, Commander. The Advent Captain seems to provide a means of stabilizing the link between the local subordinates and the Advent Network Tower itself. So for now, this mission chain has been moved outside of the research labs, which means we can focus on something else, potentially one of the long list of autopsies listed on the left here. Commander, if we're going to try to build this Skulljack that Tygen came up with, we're going to need a specialized facility to test it out. And yes indeed, like I said, the Proving Ground is now available for construction, and of course it is used for much more than just the manufacturing of the Skulljack. Among other things, we can also obtain specialized types of ammunition and grenades as well as armor and weapons from there, all of which capable of giving us very particular strategic advantages. Now we'll talk more about that in just a second, for now we are also informed that the Stun Lancer autopsy is now instant, and that is because we have acquired enough Stun Lancer corpses. Normally, all autopsies take a certain number of days, but if you collect enough corpses of one type, then that autopsy can be completed instantly, which is of course what we want to do with as many of these as possible. Instant autopsies also do not remove our chance of cashing in on inspirations or breakthroughs, so taking care of the Stun Lancer autopsy now is an easy choice. The Advent Stun Lancer was apparently outfitted with the intention of serving as a civilian peacekeeping unit within the city centers. Although they are equipped with weapons capable of administering non-lethal blows, recent reports indicate an increasingly aggressive stance taken by these units. Although Advent clearly intended for these units to be their means of dealing with any unruly civilians within the city centers, it seems they have come to rely on more brutal means of pacification in the time since. And there we are, you can see it on the left, we have unlocked two new items. First, the Ionic Ripjack, a modification and very much an upgrade to the Skirmisher's Ripjack Claw, improving upon the Ripjack's base damage and increasing that from 4 points to 6. Similar deal then with the Arc Blade, the upgrade to the Ranger Sword, once again giving that weapon a tiny damage bonus. Now at this point though, the big question is what to do next. Resistance Radio is currently inspired and would allow us to construct radio relays, which then reduce the amount of intel needed to make contact with nearby regions. Considering that the further we move away from our home base, the higher those intel costs become, this could potentially be very useful, but of course we could also start looking into improving our offensive or defensive capabilities by beginning the research of Gauss weapons and plated armor respectively. So let me know what you think we should do next, but this is only the first part of the question, because it is also high time that we make a decision regarding that next facility. The Proving Ground is the one that the game pushes us to build as part of the main storyline, but I am actually also seriously considering resistance comps instead. At the moment, no matter how much more intel we collect, we can't actually acquire any more regions, as our contact capacity is currently maxed out at 3. Resistance comms would increase that and finally allow us to make contact with those regions housing Advent facilities, and as you can imagine, taking those down is a much more reliable way of interrupting the Avatar project. There might also be a fringe case for the workshop, but I won't go into that here. Those people arguing in favor of it probably know what I'm talking about. So these are my questions for you at the end of today's episode, what to research next and what to build next. As always, I am very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts and explanations. And with that, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut for today, so as always, if you have enjoyed the episode, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up, and if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.